Hi guys, welcome to Essentially Elevated. For our fun facts section of today, we have a very fun topic, which is we're going to discuss the natural relationship there's between animals and plants. Uh, having said that, we're mostly going to focus on the wild animals because what happens? The domesticated animals like our cats and our dogs and our pets, they have for the most part lost that main instinct to get relief in nature and they also don't have the same access to like wild plants such as uh, wild animals, right? However, there are some exceptions when it comes to things that they can actually access like, you know, things in your garden or most prominently grass. So I bet you guys have seen this happen at least once in your life, which is your dear dog starts feeding on the grass. So although you may not understand why they're doing it, there are some few reasons of why this could be a natural instinct to help them get rid of something. So the first one is naturally they want to like cleanse their body and they know that the grass is going to help them vomit. The second one, they use it to actually treat intestinal worms. The third one is to improve digestion. And in the fourth case, they might just be trying to compensate for some unmet need in their nutrition, such as fiber. You know, so that's why they go to grass. Those are some of the reasons. Uh, of course, I don't encourage you to start feeding your dog grass at all, because we know that most grass nowadays just has a ton of pesticides and it can be actually very toxic for them. But that's just to give you a little insight into what goes on your little pet's mind when they do such behavior. So wild animals, in this case, the ones that don't have the comfort of a chimney and the care of a vet or even a loving owner, they actually have to go straight to nature to get their medicinal needs met. You know, and that's why they use the natural pharmacy because that's what it's available to them. Now what's funny is, although it's fairly recent, the study of the relationship between animals ingesting seeds, minerals, and different leaves to treat different ailments is called zoopharmacogni. That's because zoo stands for animal, pharma stands for medicine, and cogni stands for knowing. Isn't that cool? So this is a new science that actually studies the behavior of animals in the wild when it comes to treating their own things. So you may wonder how is it that they started detecting these uh, variations because how do you get to the conclusion that they're doing something for medicinal purposes? Well, the first giveaway is that biologists notice that animals in the wild would kind of interrupt their, their, their diet routine. It's like they would do these exceptions at given times which led them to believe that they were fulfilling another purpose other than just nutrition. You know, that's, that's one of the first variations of how they started noticing that, you know, literally animals self-medicate. You know, when they need to heal themselves, they instinctively know where to go to get their medicine. What's also very amusing and interesting is that they've also noticed that some of the indigenous cultures also learn some of their basic medicines from observing the animal behavior when it came to treating different ailments, you know? There's a lot of similarities between like leaves that are used for one purpose and then, you know, the indigenous culture adopted those beliefs and now embraces the plant for having those healing benefits. And I'll give you an example in a little bit. So it's very, very cool that, you know, from just observing what they would do, that's how cultures started building, you know, because we didn't have Google back then or any of those things. And it was all experimental and it was all based on observation. But the animals were a great inspiration to our ancestors to know where to go to treat their ailments. Back to the odd behavior of breaking one's diet. So, you know, they noticed that animals would kind of have this anomaly when it came to diet, just like in a certain periods or certain exceptions or after certain important events. So that's what gave away the fact that they were actually doing it intentionally. It's very much like pregnant women when they start getting these cravings 
during pregnancy or after or before, it's because, you know, there's always some mineral or something that they're compensating for. And I'm, I actually have that, so I'm going to put you a little picture here so you can see, like, something like when you're craving chocolate, you're really, like, magnesium deficient. And it's so interesting to know that because we think we're craving fatty foods, but we may be craving, uh, like, a nutrient or something within that kind of food. So, you know, animals do the same thing. So my first example, which I found, was that there was an African pregnant elephant. And they noticed like this, you know, constant routine when it came to feeding herself all throughout the pregnancy. Like it, it remained very stable, very predictable. But yet, when she was ready to give birth or nearing the time of giving birth, she actually walked 17 miles to another location where there was a particular shrub and she started to chew on the leaves. Shortly after that, she gave birth. So what did the experts conclude? That she went to that plant specifically because she knew it was almost time as to induce labor. And guess what else they found? They found that Kenyan women actually have a wide knowledge about this leaf and that they use it as a medicinal tea to induce labor in women. So is that a coincidence? I don't know, you know, but it's worth a try to explore how there's so many similarities between how cultures were created and the things that animals were able to, ta to teach humans that I'm not suggesting <laughs> they were having telepathic communication, but maybe it was just like very easy for them to understand. Our ancestors were more connected to the earth, to the cycles, to the moons. So maybe they were a little more aware of things that we, like, that we don't really perceive with our physical eyes anymore because we have closed our sixth sense, right? Another example that led to the same conclusion was with monkeys. With monkeys, they noticed that, you know, they not only went to certain leaves to get rid of, rid of parasites, of course, nowadays we know that certain plants can cure certain things, but you know, it was funny to find that some of the leaves they were using were actually to treat parasites. So what's different about it from the, from the elephant is that the monkey actually had displayed a little bit more complex behaviors, like rolling the leaf, putting it around the mouth, and then swallowing it whole. You know, like that requires a little bit more of logical steps than just like chewing on the right thing for the right ailment. So they displayed a little bit more of complex behavior when it came to how they self-medicated. And they also peeled little stems from these bitter leaves to treat that parasite thing. They also have um, a citrus juice that they use as insect repellent. What's funny about it is that, you know, now differentiating between the elephant and the primates, they noticed a common trend between primates, which was that their behavior was actually learned. And it was like literally passed from generation to generation. Because from an early age, they noticed that the mother would indicate the little baby to not touch certain leaves and to go to other leaves. So it was more like a, yeah, it was a learned behavior. It was a, a ritual that was passed on of self-care. So that's pretty cool. And then another thing they noticed was that other types of monkeys were actually stealing coals from the bonfire. So what happens is that, you know, we all know that carbon is used in most of our digestive uh, medicines nowadays because it's great to alleviate indigestion. And so these monkeys actually knew to go to carbon because part of their diet is almond seeds and mangoes and mangoes have phenols which can be toxic when it comes to digesting them so they kind of ate those carbon coals whatever just to make sure that they could like process it and not interfere with their diet because you know you have to think that sometimes animals they only have the resources they have at their disposal, you know, they can't be that selective. We're like, oh, I think I'm going to do pineapples today. I think I'm going to do this and that. So I guess among the options that they have, they try to choose the foods that instinctively are more nutritious to them. 
But you know, I guess they're also aware of the fact that some of them can be very toxic to their little bodies. So those are some of the things that I found that proved that there was actually an intentional relationship between making certain exceptions in your diet and treating certain ailments, which fulfilled uh, the purpose of keeping the animal in a good condition and in good health, and ultimately to help it survive. So whereas like most animals learned this behavior through many, many years of evolution, and it was very much like, you know, the strongest is going to survive, they kind of had to learn to self-medicate in order to preserve their species, you know what I mean? Even though probably a, a few of them died along the way, just to say the very least. Because, you know, of course, I guess in the process, they found that some things were actually very toxic and they could induce death. But then I guess the knowledge that they preserved about the things that were actually good to treat certain things, that's what made the species reproduce and ultimately survive. Now when it comes to using plant-based things on your pets, I would definitely, I am not a vet, and I don't want to recommend anyone to use essential oils on their pets, unless your vet really recommended it and taught you how to do it because yeah, I don't have a certification on animal alternative therapy. However, I did, you know, find out that although it is not recommended to use essential oils because they can be way too strong on your pet, some people do use hydrosols, which I told you in another episode, the hydrosols are a mix between the essential oil and the water of the plant. So it's a very watered down version of the essential oils so that's just one thing I read but again I'm not gonna recommend anything because I want you guys to go ahead and not do something to your pet that you're going to regret and last but not least I want to leave you with another fun fact which was you know some of the healing powers that the animals that we're exposed to every day or pets have that we're not even aware of so dog saliva for example is used to treat wounds it's proven to be ineffective uh, thing to treat wounds. No, don't have your dog lick your hand. Don't do any of that. Just absorb the information and just see the magic and everything and how everything is so perfectly orchestrated in this world that you know there's a solution and a cure for everything. That's one of the first ones. The second one was that cats purring. The, the purr of the cats has such a distinctive frequency that ranges from 20 to 140 hertz, which is like a, you know, what we would call in yoga and meditation, a very high vibration, which actually has the capacity to start inducing healing in broken bones. It's like it has this magic power to start releasing um, strained muscles to help repair ligaments and tendons. So, you know, next time your cat is driving you crazy, know that they're doing you a favor by, by being there. And of course, it's also been proven that cats, they just filtrate all the negative energy in your house. So if you notice that your cat may be overweight, and maybe that they're like overwhelmed with all the energy they have to purify in your house when it comes to negativity, so maybe it's time to start doing a little house cleaning. And the last one was that, in general, household pets help raise the baby's immunity. Uh, of course, use your own discernment. If you have a newborn, you know, and you're thinking about this, like, the evil eye and the cat disease and all that stuff. But, you know, it's one of the fun facts that I found that was interesting because, you know, oh, by the way, I'm not saying to do this with reptiles or snakes or any of that stuff, but... You know, for the most part, I think it, it was talking about cats and dogs that they, I, they're just, they just bring the baby's immunity up because they are very comforting and they have very loving energies. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I certainly did enjoy learning about these things. And it's amazing, you know, so worse comes to worse. I mean, if your adrenaline kicks in and you decide to do this, like, excursion in the middle of nowhere, well, hopefully you find some kind of plant that'll aid you or just take your essential oils with you, you know, just in case, just to be sure that you're not going to have some serious health issues while exploring the world. But now you know that's how the animal species managed to survive all this time, you know? 
it was because they went straight to nature's pharmacy. So I will see you next time.